Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today, we've got uh, a follow-up topic that ties back into a couple of videos we shot almost a year ago, uh, where we're covering the Battleship Triad, speed, armor, and firepower. And previously, we've talked a little bit about speed, we've talked a little bit about firepower. Today, we're going to talk about Battleship Armor. But first, a word from the museum. Hi, I'm Ken Kirsch with the Battleship New Jersey. I was on the ship during Vietnam, 67 to 69. As you can see, this was my work area, the machine shop, and currently we still use it making parts for the ship. I'm a manager of the overnight program, and please consider donating to the Battleship New Jersey. It's a nonprofit museum and memorial to the sailors that served on the ship. Thanks for your attention. Every battleship is a balance of speed, firepower, and armor. And different countries prioritize this in different ways. Uh, and class to class, the priorities don't remain the same. The early American dreadnoughts and standard type battleships tended to prioritize firepower first, armor second, and if all the ships could make the same battle line speed of 21 knots, great. Uh, spoiler alert, they couldn't even all do that, although they, they got relatively close with the designs. So the US Navy had a relatively unbalanced, powerful, slow battle line that if it could force another battle line into combat, would probably win. Uh, the only real time we see this happen is at Suragawa Strait, the last surface battle in history. But, uh, you know, if they had a cause it to happen before that, they, they would have probably won. The problem is a more maneuverable fleet could avoid battle entirely, or a fleet comprised of uh, both fast and slow ships might be able to pin the American line down and then use the fast ships to uh, run around them. So when the Washington Naval Treaty and the London Naval Treaties expired, the Navy started to look at faster alternatives, and they settled on a new standard of about 27 knots, uh, and they decided that they wanted a faster class of ship as well because they had never successfully built a fast uh, capital gunship. And that became the Iowa class, which prioritizes speed first, then firepower, uh, and then armor is in last place, a distant last place. So we'll talk about a little bit the evolution of armor, what the Iowas did, and uh, what some contemporaries were doing. Some stuff in here will uh, be redundant or abbreviated versions of what you've seen in other uh, videos we've done, particularly ship comparison videos, um, like how do Iowa stack up against Bismarck or Yamato, because we do go into uh, pretty good depth there about those ships' armor for hours. So make sure you check all of those out. There's a link to the playlist in the description below. So, first of all, early warships did not prioritize armor. They prioritized uh, speed and firepower. I'm talking, of course, about the Mediterranean galleys of ancient Greece, uh, Carthage, and Rome. These ships had to be as light and fast as possible to be able to use their offensive rams. They were ore-powered, so weight had a lot to do with the speed they were able to generate and thus the penetrating power. By the time we get up to actual sail warships, um, the wind is allowing them to build heavier ships, so you start to see armor in the form of solid wood. The culmination of this happens in the uh, early 1800s when uh, different types of hardwood start to be used and the frame spacing on these ships gets pushed closer together. So in addition to having an outside hull that's about two feet thick in places, you've got frames that are close to two feet thick in places for your line of battleships. And when you push these frames together such that there isn't a gap in between them large enough for an enemy uh, projectile to punch through, well, you have well armored your ship. And that was great against solid shot uh, but guns 
and armor are constantly in competition. So the exploding shell was invented. The exploding shell was able to detonate and blow holes in wooden armor. Uh, and so it wasn't too long after that that armor took a step up and uh, they started making iron sides on vessels. And this was just iron plate onto the wood backing. So this early armor acknowledges that armor plating is inherently brittle. So you've got the hard iron outside, which is supposed to stop a projectile from penetrating, but then you've got a soft wood backing, which is supposed to have a little bit of give and uh, prevent any of that brittleness from causing holes in the ship. Uh, and, and all the way through the Age of Ironclads and into the pre-Dreadnought battleship era, you see much thicker wood backing behind your armor plating. So uh, early notable ironclads are the French La Glore and the uh, British Warrior. And then uh, the Confederacy builds CSS Virginia on the hull of the Union steam frigate Merrimack. And the Union responds with a series of designs. Um, Monitor, which is a completely new design, which will one day uh, evolve into battleships, and new Ironsides. Just for the record, old Ironsides, the USS Constitution, has a live oak hull with a really close frame spacing. She is made exclusively of wood. New Ironsides is basically a uh, wooden sloop of war with an armored belt put around the gun battery. Uh, and the belt is a concept we're going to come back to. Many of these wooden hauled ships are not, uh, do not have complete iron plating all the way around. It just protects the important parts where the guns are in a belt. So. More about that later. Uh, these ships still have iron armor. It's not until about the 1870s, 1880s that we start to get steel armor. And uh, early steel is metallurgically better than iron, but inferior to the types of steel that Battleship New Jersey is built out of. So they start to do stuff uh, to steel to mess with how brittle it is. And you can make different alloys that uh, will make it more resistant or more brittle or, you know, and, and sometimes you want a really hard outer armor and sometimes you want a softer, more uh, ductile armor. Um, one of the first armor plates that replaces iron and early steels is called Harvey Nickel Steel. So you start adding a little bit of nickel to your steel and uh, it becomes more effective. Early American pre-dreadnoughts used this and some European countries did too. Meanwhile, uh, at a little bit later, the Germans come up with Krupp armor and we start to get uh, face hardening where if you heat one side of the armor more than the other side and there's a difference in the carbon in the front face and the back face, you can make part of the armor really uh, hard but brittle and part of the armor soft but able to bend. So if your striking face, the face towards the enemy, is hard and the back face is soft, then that, that is the ideal composition for the type of steel armor that uh, that's being made at this point. The problem is making sure you don't face harden it so that it goes too far through you only want maybe 30 or 40 percent of the face to actually be hard and brittle and the rest you want to be soft. So Krupp armor, face hardened armor, uh, and, and this is pretty consistent throughout the later pre-dreadnought and uh, dreadnought era. By World War II you start to get uh, some different stuff. The Germans are still using a Krupp uh, type of armor called uh, Watton. Only ever seen it written. Maybe I'm pronouncing that wrong. The British have uh, probably the most effective armor in the world. It's called 
Dussel. Um, if you know how to pronounce Watton or Dussel, let us know in the comment section down below, because I can barely speak American, much less any of these other languages. The American armor at this time comes in a couple of different types. We've got uh, mild steel, which is your un armored, like regular stuff they would use in normal construction. Then we've got uh, high tensile steel, which is a little bit better, still construction quality, not armor quality. And Battleship New Jersey has some of this, uh, some of both mild and uh, HTS throughout. And then you have STS, special treatment steel. And uh, that is your light armor plating, it only goes up to about five inches thick. Uh, and then you've got your Class A and Class B armor. Class A armor is that super brittle stuff, and you use that where you don't have room for defense in depth, so you just need the hardest thing possible. And then you got Class B armor, which is uh, less brittle, and the Iowa class battleships tend to use a lot more of that. And we'll go into that a lot more later. So that's armor. Early dreadnoughts. Uh, and late pre-dreadnoughts tried to armor some of everything. Uh, pre-dreadnoughts found that they couldn't hit the broadside of a barn with their main guns, and they certainly didn't have fire control out to long range, so at most battle ranges, they were actually doing most of the hitting with their light broadside guns. And so, in addition to a main armored belt that was thick enough to stop your main battery guns, they started to armor these ships at the ends and in the superstructures with uh, lighter armor to protect against the secondary guns. So if, if you open up a Jane's fighting ships and you look at the armor diagrams there, you see um, different color bands representing different thicknesses of armor all over the ship. Uh, deck armor isn't important at this point, and some ships still have purely wooden decks without any uh, actual armor plating at all, because the ranges you can engage, uh, you don't have plunging fire yet. So, this is just how ships are built, with all sorts of thicknesses of armor, so that enemy light guns can't pick apart the exposed bits of your ship. By the time we get into the middle of the Dreadnought era, uh, right before the Super Dreadnought generation, the US Navy comes up with what's called the all or nothing armor scheme. With the invention of Dreadnought and uh, corresponding fire control equipment, ships are now armed with all big guns and they don't have all as many of these uh, lighter calibers and the battle ranges begin to open beyond the range of those lighter calibers. The lighter guns are just for driving off smaller ships. Uh, so now dreadnoughts are just shooting each other with heavy guns. However, they continue to have different thicknesses of armor plating all over the place. The US Navy uh, with the Nevada class battleships around 1913, 1914-ish, comes up with this all or nothing armor scheme where you only armor the critical part of the ship, and that will protect you from enemy fire, and uh, you just leave the rest of the ship completely unarmored. If somebody hits you there with a heavy caliber shell, maybe the shell will punch through one side and out the other without detonating. Uh, it's real easy to fix a 14 inch round hole. You just put a plug in it. If the shell hits and explodes, it's much more difficult to fix a jagged hole. Uh, so, ships like that endeavored to create what's called an armored citadel, where you've got the belt along the side of the ship, and that would extend from just in front of the forward turret to just behind the aft turret. The top of the citadel would be an armored deck, and the bottom of the citadel would be a uh, multi-bottom system, usually double or sometimes triple bottom. Uh, and then you've got an armored bulkhead, at the forward and aft end of this structure. So that box is completely armored and you're supposed to have enough reserve of buoyancy in that box, it, there's enough air in that box, that uh, if the rest of your ship is shot to pieces, you're not going to flood. Or 
you might flood, but it's not going to be enough to sink you because you've got all of your reserve of buoyancy in this middle part of the ship. And um, important stuff goes in there. Unimportant stuff goes outside the ship, uh, outside the armored citadel. So like birthing spaces, mess spaces, the captain's cabin, none of that's important. Fuel, ammunition, radio equipment, uh, medical spaces, those all tend to be in the armored part. After World War I, we get into the treaty system and uh, the various countries have a number of both old ships to test on uh, because they have to scrap a lot of their old ships and a lot of um, half-built modern ships that they're not allowed to complete and they can test on those. Uh, so the naval treaties uh, created something of a renaissance in armor design because now you can test your current weapons against your current armor and uh, you know what your own armor's vulnerabilities are and you know what your own projectiles are good enough uh, good against. You don't necessarily know what the uh, other countries do. So countries like uh, the United States which is able to expend the nearly complete battleship Washington, uh, a number of older pre-dreadnoughts and uh, even a German uh, dreadnought type battleship get valuable experience. Great Britain also has uh, British, uh, uh, German ships that they're able to test their fire on and, and plenty of their own. Countries like Japan uh, continue to use British World War I era armor throughout and while they invest massively in new guns and new projectiles, they don't really invest in new types of armor. Uh, and then countries like Germany don't really have uh, ships to expend because the Allies have taken all of their ships. Uh, and so their armor system also remains fairly uh, World War I-centric, dreadnought era, even into World War II. They never adopt the all-or-nothing scheme. So, uh, it's important to talk about some concepts when you're designing a ship. First off, you try to build your ship with the biggest guns possible. If there's a bigger gun out there, why wouldn't you use it? These ships are massive investments for their, their countries and they're uh, very much prestige symbols. So you're not gonna try and build something that's smaller than what everyone else has. So you build your ship with the biggest possible guns and you assume that everybody else is building ships with guns that size. So you always try to armor your ship against your own size gun. And so uh, the concept of the immunity zone comes up. You can never armor your ship against everything. Somebody's always going to have a bigger gun or you're going to be fighting at ranges so close that it doesn't matter how thick your armor is. Uh, at certain ranges, anything can just go through your armor like a hot knife through butter. Uh, so you come up with an immunity zone where you're looking at all right, at uh, certain angles and at certain distances our armor can stop our own size shells. The really rough rule of thumb for this is that uh, it takes about an inch of armor to stop an inch of shell. So a 16 inch shell might be able to punch through 16 inches of armor plate but it probably can't punch through 17 inches of armor plate. So with a ship like New Jersey, we're building it with 16-inch guns. Uh, we assume everybody else is building ships with 16-inch guns. At this point, as many people believe that Yamato is 45,000 tons with 16-inch guns, as believe that she's 65,000 tons with 18-inch guns. Uh, surely nobody would build a ship that large. So, uh, spaces like the Conning Tower where you can't do anything special, it's just got to be a solid armor plate, you armor with 17.3 inches of armor and that'll stop your own size projectile, in theory. So back to the immunity zone. An enemy shell at certain angles is going to hit your belt armor, the side of the ship, usually lower trajectories. And at greater ranges, there'll be a higher trajectory, so it'll be hitting your deck armor. 
the shell probably isn't going to hit your armor straight on. It's going to hit at an angle because it's lobbed in a trajectory. So you're not just worried about my belt is 16 inches thick because I've got a 16 inch gun. Um, really, if something is hitting that belt at an angle, your armor is more than 16 inches thick. So if it goes straight through, it's 16 inches. If it goes through at an angle, it ends up being 18, 19, 20 inches effectively. So at certain ranges, you're immune. Eventually, that angle drops as the range drops and it becomes closer to firing straight on. So uh, for belt armor, you rarely see your armor, especially with super dreadnoughts and on, as thick as uh, your main battery gun because unless you get down to five, six, seven miles, um, they're going to be hitting it at a trajectory and it's not going to it's going to have a greater equivalent thickness than what the paper actually says it is. Uh, likewise, once you start to get up in range, the shells are coming down on your deck and they're always going to hit the deck at an angle. And so at certain angles, shallow angles, they're hitting the deck and bouncing off. And it's not until you get out to really far ranges where the projectile's coming down at a relatively flat trajectory and can punch through. So you get immunity zones against uh, your own shells, where there's a distance, oftentimes it's somewhere between 20 and 30,000 yards, about 10 to 15 miles, where other ships firing guns like yours can't punch through. At the low end of that, uh, around the 10 mile mark, their shells have such a trajectory that they're hitting the belt and not punching through. And at the high end, they've got such a trajectory that they're hitting the deck and not punching through. You go beyond that 15 miles and now their shells are coming down at a steeper trajectory and can punch through the deck. You go inside of that uh, seven miles and the shell is being fired at a flat enough trajectory that it can punch through your belt. So with the Iowa class, we've got an armored bulkhead that's 11 and a half inches thick just forward of turret one and just aft of turret three. Uh, that's for Iowa and New Jersey. Missouri and Wisconsin uh, authorized a year later and Illinois and Kentucky after them have a 14 and a half inch bulkhead. They um, were more free of treaty restrictions than Iowa and New Jersey and had the lead time to be able to order new armor plate for there. So those form the ends of the armored bulkheads, uh, of the armored part of the ship. We've got an armored barbette, which our turret sits on, uh, one for each turret, and those are inside of this. And we've got all of our engineering spaces between those. We've got a triple bottom, uh, we've got armored decks, and we've got an armored box over our steering gear, which happens to be aft of the armored citadel. Uh, and just to get more reserve of buoyancy, that armored box also encloses our massive refrigeration spaces, which normally isn't something you'd worry about armoring, but you know, they're, they're full of air, so great. Uh, and we've got multiple layers on the side of the ship, which culminate in a uh, greater than 12 inch thick armored belt. Uh, it's important to talk at this point about active versus passive armor. Uh, passive armor is all the steel plate you throw on your ship. That's just there. It, even if the ship doesn't have crew on it and somebody's shooting at it, it'll do its job. Uh, ships also have active protection in the form of their crews. Uh, and a well-trained crew with pretty good damage control experience can make up a lot for a lack of armor. Uh, notoriously during World War II, the U.S. Navy developed uh, incredibly effective damage control procedures that were able to save ships that uh, other nations would have lost. Uh, heck, damage control parties were able, even able to return some ships to port that it was determined weren't worth repairing, uh, but they were able to keep these ships from sinking and sail them all the way back home. Other countries uh, didn't 
create as effective damage control procedures. So uh, if you get the chance, read Shattered Sword by Partial and Tully about the uh, Battle of Midway. Uh, that talks about Japanese damage control procedures. The average American citizen maybe had more uh, technical experience than the average Japanese exper uh, sailor, more factory experience, more machinery experience, and so uh, took two tasks which required equipment better than the average Japanese sailor. The Japanese uh, damage control parties tended to be formed by the engineering departments that had that sort of experience. So um, if something hits your engineering spaces, you lose large parts of your damage control parties. American ships Practically every sailor was trained in damage control. Modern ships tend to lean more on active uh, protection than passive protection. Modern ships just don't have armor plating. The nuclear carriers have a four inch belt, uh, which is negligible, but uh, they have crews who can repair anything that's damaged. Let's talk a little bit about torpedo defense here, too. The Iowa-class battleships have uh, a pretty typical American system where you've got five layers of torpedo defense, which is to say that the hull has five layers of steel thick, and there are void spaces between each of those layers of steel. Some of the void spaces are liquid-loaded, and that is to absorb a lot of the impact of explosions, and some of those void spaces are uh, true void spaces, so if they are punctured, an explosion that has now been dampened by going through the liquid loading and several layers of steel uh, now gets to expand in all directions instead of being focused against the uh, armor inside of it. And uh, this American system, I'd argue, is probably the best torpedo defense system ever devised. However, the depth of a torpedo defense system is often more important than what you're actually doing. So the five-layer American system is pretty good, but on ships that don't have much depth to their five-layer system, or on parts of the ships that don't have much depth, for example, the Iowa-class battleships get very narrow towards the bow, uh, especially around turret one. This is to attain the high speed. Remember, that's the number one priority. The armor plating there uh, around the torpedo defense is has less depth than it does throughout the rest of the ship. So a torpedo hit there would be more likely to penetrate than a torpedo hit amidships. Bismarck doesn't have a whole heck of a lot in the way of multiple layers of steel for her torpedo defense, but she's a wider ship than the Iowa's and there's more depth devoted to torpedo defense. And Bismarck ate a couple of torpedoes from British Swordfish uh, and eventually from the cruiser Dorsetshire. And um, was able to do this without significant impacts to her combat ability. So depth important. A couple other countries did things uh, differently from the American layering system. Uh, notable examples are the British crushing tube system and the Italian Pugli cylinder systems. And uh, these both work basically the same way. You would have a hollow cylinder floating inside of your liquid loaded void space. And uh, it's a similar concept. The liquid is supposed to dampen the explosion and uh, the crushing tubes or the cylinders which are empty are supposed to crush and eat a lot of that uh, energy from the explosion so that it is not directed against the holding bulkhead. The holding bulkhead is the innermost uh, bulkhead that uh, is the wall between the torpedo defense and the livable habitable part of the ship. Oftentimes, these systems, rather than uh, absorbing the impact and crushing, just redirected the impact around the cylinders and 
directed it against the holding bulkhead. So I consider those systems to be significantly inferior to the five layer system. Additionally, the five layer system, you go in and you uh, replace those five layers of plate from the inside out and you've patched up your torpedo damage. With crushing tubes or uh, Pugli cylinders, you've got to open up the thing and remove the cylinders or tubes that have been damaged and replace them with new undamaged ones or somehow straighten them out. Uh, so more difficult to fix. Italian battleships notoriously fared poorly against torpedoes. Uh, a couple of older British battleships that were hit by torpedoes also sank, although uh, Royal Oak and Scapa Flow was not fully manned, so it's hard to hold that against them. Uh, Prince of Wales was a mitigating factor. The hit opened up a uh, propeller shaft alley that didn't... Uh, so that, that's not a reflection on a poor de torpedo defense there. That could have happened to any ship, probably. Um, but I consider the American system pretty good at Pearl Harbor. Some of our battleships, which were not fully manned, were sunk by torpedoes, um, but they were mostly returned to service unless they were really old and hit by a tremendous amount of torpedoes. And uh, the one modern example of one of these ships getting hit by a torpedo, North Carolina, uh, hit in the weakest part of the defense and didn't destroy the ship. And it was a torpedo that was bigger than what the Americans calculated for, so it should have overmatched that armor. Uh, likewise, carriers like Saratoga, which used the same sort of uh, five-layer system, but with lighter armor, were able to survive repeated torpedo hits. So, there are some places where you just have to use thickness to prevent a shell from coming in. The things that are exposed on the main deck that need to be armored, the gun turrets, the conning tower, uh, those you just want super thick class A armor. That stuff's expensive and heavy though, so in places like the hall where you can have a defense in depth, you use a multi-layer system. So for example, the deck is three layers thick. There is a inch and a half thick bomb deck, that's made out of special treatment steel. That will decap an armor-piercing shell or detonate a high-capacity shell. If something punches through that, which it's thin enough to allow, uh, you've got the roughly six-inch thick main armor deck. It's class B armor. That is designed to stop anything that hits it. And if it hits at any sort of angle, it's probably going to be defeated. But... And armor's fairly brittle. So while it might stop things on the outside, you'll get what's called spalling, where splinters break off the inside where it's been hit. Um, so beneath that is a third level, the splinter deck, which is pretty thin and pretty elastic and will absorb that impact and bend, but not break and let those splinters into the uh, armored part of the ship. The sides of the ship are similar in that the shell plating is inch and a half thick STS. And then there's the series of voids and liquid loaded spaces. You've got the armored belt around the sides that is about 12.1 inches thick. And then you've got a holding bulkhead behind that in case the class B armor belt has spalling. The armored belt on Iowa class battleships is at an angle. It's a rather steep angle of 19 degrees. This causes some problems and it solves some problems. By angling the 12 inch belt at 19 degrees, you're basically giving it an equivalent thickness of 13 and a half or 14 inches against relatively flat trajectory shots, which is good. You're using less armor to uh, have greater equivalent thickness. You're saving weight. These ships were designed to a treaty limit uh, and Congress mandated the cost of these ships. The problem is, You've got something straight up and down, that's only as tall as your hull. In our case, uh, about 50 or 60 feet tall, if you're doing the whole side of the ship, and you tend not to with an armored belt. When you angle it, 
to cover that same 50 or 60 feet, you now need 70, 80, 90 feet of armor. Uh, so the trick is to get an angle that'll both defeat shots, but not add more length so that the weight of it ends up being even more than your uh, just solid thick piece of armor. Next, you've got laminating multiple layers together. If you were to uh, take, say, a three inch armored deck and then try and put two more inches on top of it, you've got five inches of armor, right? Wrong. It's not the same equivalent thickness. Uh, it maybe only has the same equivalent thickness of three and a half or four inches of armor. And there's a formula to figure that out that engineers and people who do the maths uh, know. So, uh, for example, the pre-treaty dreadnoughts that different countries saved were allowed to use 3,000 tons to add more armor to their decks and more torpedo protection. Just adding new layers on top of old layers wasn't very effective. Likewise, if you were to uh, have your layer of steel and then have a gap and then another layer of steel, that is a little bit better than if you just lay two inches on top of three inches, but it's still not quite there. So it was determined that uh, if you were to have a little bit of steel, a gap, a uh, heavy layer of steel, and then a thin layer added onto that, you have a greater equivalent thickness than the individual thicknesses added together. So in some places on the ship, that was used. Now, it's worth mentioning that uh, as great as I say IO class armor is, it was very much a compromise. It was the lowest priority of the designers. They basically took the armor scheme from the previous South Dakota class, which, while good, is not best. Because the armored belt is on the inside, you've got to launch your ships at a heavier displacement, which means you need stronger building ways. So New Jersey's building ways had to be modified before she could be built there. It required an additional expenditure. Also, uh, because it's on the inside, if it takes damage, then uh, it's real hard to repair. You've got to cut away the exterior plates to get to the armor plate. And third, the actual shell plating of the ship isn't armored. A destroyer with five inch guns can punch a ton of holes in the side of this ship and cause extensive flooding, uh, maybe even enough to compromise our torpedo defense system. And without penetrating the armored citadel, the ship will affect the ship's ability to float. And that's not even fighting a full on battleship. So internal armor belts were not preferred. Also, uh, the armored belt forms part of the torpedo defense system. The armored belt is rigid, whereas the torpedo defense system should be able to uh, absorb an impact and bend. Uh, and with an angled belt that is directing the explosion downwards towards where the angled belt meets the bottom of the ship, which is the thinnest and weakest connection. So, uh, if a torpedo explosion reaches that rigid belt armor, one, it's gonna shear where the thin part of the belt armor meets up with the thick part of the belt armor and make a big hole up there. And two, it's gonna be directed downwards and shear uh, where it meets the bottom of the ship and create a hole there. Uh, and so your system is effectively defeated. So Montana, which was closer to the ideal, the class of battleships coming after Iowa, had an external belt. It was still angled for greater equivalent thickness, but it was mounted on the outside of the ship. And the belt didn't go all the way to the bottom of the ship. They had an external belt and they had more belt armor inside that overlapped some, uh, but formed part of the torpedo bulkhead. And by removing this, it meant when a torpedo hit, it wasn't gonna rip away there. So it's, it's already there forming an armored bulkhead. So that's what the Navy really preferred to do if they could. So these ships are very much a compromise. But all battleships are compromises. Uh, on this channel before, I've talked about 
Arizona. She's armed with 14-inch guns, so she's armored against 14-inch guns. The problem was the bombs used during the attack on Pearl Harbor uh, by the level bombers, the Cates, were modified 16.1-inch naval shells. The battleships Nagato and Mutsu used these types of shells, and the Japanese had enough of them laying around. They modified some into aerial bombs. So effectively, Arizona, with armor to stop 14-inch shells, was hit by a 16-inch shell. That overmatches her armor, is able to reach a magazine, and destroy the ship. In some of our ship comparison videos, we talk about Hood and Bismarck's armor schemes. They both use a much older World War I style scheme. Uh, and both of these schemes are pretty good for close in fighting, but not very good against plunging fire. So be sure to watch those videos and see how those ships fared. They both use uh, something interesting, which is a turtle deck design. So they've got their belt armor, and then they've got an angled deck and then a flat deck. So a projectile coming into the belt armor not only has to defeat that, but then it has to defeat the turtle deck to get into the engineering spaces. Pretty difficult. However, it's real easy for plunging fire to go over the belt and defeat that system. You know, I'd be remiss in talking about armor if I didn't mention the Japanese battleship Yamato, which is the most heavily armored battleship ever. Although I think Bismarck devotes a higher percentage of her total displacement to armor. Bismarck does not use the all or nothing system uh, effectively. She uses a World War I system. Yamato uses more of an all or nothing system and uh, has armor plate up to 24 inches thick to protect against her own size 18 inch guns. The US Navy did have a prototype 18 inch gun and there were discussions with both the Iowa and the uh, Montana class designs to install that type of gun ended up not happening. It ended up taking a massive amount of punishment to sink Yamato and Musashi. Their armor wasn't perfect. Uh, there, there were failures in the torpedo defense that led to their loss, but with the number of projectiles thrown against them, there really wasn't any way to save those ships. Uh, they remained the most armored ships ever, and uh, possibly the only battleships ever built that could have withstood New Jersey's own guns. However, following World War II, the various navies of the world basically stopped armoring their ships. The invention of missiles being able to hit at long ranges has led to uh, no desire to armor ships. Armor is expensive, it makes your ships heavy. Uh, if you're making your ships heavier, it takes more propulsive equipment to make them go faster, which makes your ship longer, which means you need more armor, which makes your ship heavier. So it becomes a self-perpetuating issue. Speed and ability to respond to crises around the world means you want a fast ship. But in order to be able to manufacture enough ships to go around the world to respond to all these crises, you uh, need them to be light and cheap. And so with the end of World War II and the end of uh, colonial spheres of influences, you're no longer protecting your own zone with an uh, armored battle fleet. You're now going out into other people's countries all over the world with fast, light ships. And so the use of armor in ships has fallen away. There has been some extremely interesting developments in tank armor using uh, reactive systems, ceramic systems, and of course also in tank uh, and anti-tank projectiles using sabo rounds and uh, other systems like that. And so uh, shaped charge warheads and whatnot. So it would be very interesting to see if we ever returned to armored ships and then also were developing anti-armor weapons and warheads, where that would end up. But basically hasn't happened since the Montanas were canceled. Um, at this point, it's worth mentioning that um, there is a lot of propaganda from the 1980s that the Iowa's or missile proof 
and uh, surely with their armor plate, they could have survived missile hits that no other ship in the world could have. But there has not been a surface battle since 1944, so we don't know how effective these ships would have actually been against modern missile technology. The Navy wasn't willing to expend any of their old battleship hulls to test this technology. Instead, they were turned into museums. Uh, in fact, only a single supercarrier, the capital ships that have replaced the battleship, has ever been expended in weapons tests. That's the USS America. And those tests are still very classified, so it's hard to say how effective a large ship with a lot of subdivision, uh, pretty strong structure, and uh, massive internal compartmentalization and reserve of buoyancy would be able to handle modern cruise missile hits. I can tell you an Iowa-class battleship could stop the gunfire from any other ship out there, because I don't think there's another ship in the world with greater than a 6-inch or 155-millimeter gun right now. Thank you guys for watching. If you want to see our armor in person, be sure to come out and tour the ship. Check our website for our hours. Uh, some places, like the armored turrets and the conning tower, you can pretty well see the armor plating. Other places, like the armored belt, because we use an internal belt system, it is real hard to see. Uh, if you sign up for a curator's behind-the-scenes tour, I will take you to as many different places to show you what can be seen of the armor as possible. Most of these places are not on the normal tour route. Which battleship do you think had the best armor protection? Let us know in the comments section down below. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State. We also receive support from uh, a number of other institutions and many, many private donors like yourselves. Uh, in fact, donations from viewers like you have allowed us to take these videos from airing one time a week to five times a week. So I appreciate your support, and if you would like what we're doing, what the museum's doing, and you would like to contribute to that, there's a link in the description for ways you can donate. Because we're releasing so much content, remember to like, share, and subscribe so that you're notified when we put out new stuff. Thanks for watching.